Um, so I guess we're supposed to start with Qantas, right? <laughs> 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 we're supposed to talk about Qantas and how that how I, that happened. Yeah. Um, and they were going to give you a free flight. Yeah, no, they were. Know. I don't know yeah. if you know in this movie in this movie I did a number of years ago called Rain Man, and uh, they were supposed to <laughs> <laughs> supposed to fly to Los Angeles. I think people Angeles, might remember it. Yeah. And, uh, Raymond won't get on a, any flight that crashed. And they start, he said, well, what about United? No, it crashed. What about American Airlines? No, it crashed. And, the, and he's rattling off dates. And then he said, but all airlines have crashed. And uh, Raymond says, uh, Qantas, Qantas never crashed. <laughs> and then uh, the, the movie went on, did quite well. And then Qantas offered me a, a trip to Australia. Yep. And uh, which unfortunately I couldn't do, but I, I was, <laughs> It's one of those crazy things that uh, basically a throwaway line in a film sort of uh, caught on, certainly with the Qantas people. I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna bet that if you called them up, the offer would still be good. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Um, I wanted to start with a broad question and just ask you about how, from a filmmaker's perspective, the landscape of production and getting movies made and getting them seen and how they're seen has changed for you personally. It's a big question, but I just thought. Well, it'd be I mean, it's it, look. I mean, we're looking at a radical change in uh, the whole landscape of film or streaming or whatever, whatever you want to call any of it. Um, you did have the protection initially that if you made a movie at a studio, uh, you would get some kind of distribution. Uh, where nowadays you can make a film and almost and on, in some cases not get distribution. Mm -hmm. They'll, they'll put it out in two theaters and spend very little money, and then that'll be the end of the film. And uh, I've had a few of those. It just it's, you get no traction, and they're you know people that even that I know and close to they'll go, oh, when did you do that film? Right. You know I didn't know anything about that film. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the that's the times we're in. I mean there's there's a good side of it that there's a a great deal of content that can be distributed in a lot of different ways and a lot of stuff can get lost in the shuffle of it that's all. That's right because it's all content yeah. so you know. Yeah. So the studios have basically worked in one area which is you know aiming for films that'll do a hundred million dollars for a weekend. Right. And uh, that so therefore the demands of that type of film uh, generally have to be much larger yeah. In, in its scope. So the kind of smaller and more intimate films have, in a sense, are a casualty of all of that. So mm -hmm. that, that basically becomes a domain of, of uh, small independence and also streaming. Yeah. But then on the other hand, the, the, the reverse side of that is that, as my old friend Paul Schrader would say, there's more money falling off the table to finance small films with you know, Netflix, um, Amazon now Apple is moving in you know mm -hmm. and uh, but then are they going to be seen that's always the question right yeah and then, and you discover things you know because sometimes you're just yeah. looking on some site and you'll see some film and you go gee I never heard of that and you check it out and you might really enjoy it so but you really have to shuffle through to find that yeah uh, so you don't get that support you know it's always that constant the good, the good and the bad of it all. Right, that's right. You know what I mean? But I mean, look, I, the first film I ever did, Diner, um, which was made by a studio, MGM, mm -hmm. uh, and they so hated it that they didn't ever want to release it. Right. It only got out by accident, yeah. by some mistake that happened, and yeah. we out ultimately got out and kept playing. Another wise move from the studio. Yes. Yeah, yeah, which is... You know. <laughs> I mean, the irony is yeah. it only had 200 prints made, uh -huh. and it played for a year. Yeah. Just kept going from city to city, city. But um, did they wind up making more prints, striking more prints? No, that's all they ever had. Yeah, wow. You know, because they ne they couldn't understand the movie. They didn't understand it. Yeah. Um, which happens, uh, you know, because they don't. They said, but I, I don't understand. I don't understand what these characters are, and yeah. I, they didn't understand any of it. Did so, you get a lot of notes? <laughs> no, they couldn't. It, it, the, the saving grace is that I never had to cut the film at all because they thought it was so unwatchable <laughs> that they left it alone. But then how did they wind <laughs> But that's crazy <laughs> that they wound up releasing it. That's amazing. No, but they wouldn't have released it. That's by accident. Right, okay, yeah. They wouldn't have. Yeah. Uh, Pauline Kael yeah. uh, got to see it yeah. and called the studio and said, 
uh, when is the film opening? They said, we have no plans to open it. And she says, but, you know, I would give it a rave review. Yeah. And they said, well, we don't have plans. She says, well, I'm going to run the review anyway. Right. Even if it's not playing in the United States. Yeah. And that scared the studio. And so they opened up at the festival theater that's no longer there on 57th That's Street. where I saw it. And, um, um, yeah. and it caught on. Yeah. And then it's kept playing around the country. So yeah. there were a few, you know, critics that began to support it. And it kind of it worked in that way. That's something else that's changed the, the landscape of film criticism yeah. since, you know, yeah. that's when the newspapers started to deal with their problems. The first thing that went was film criticism. Yeah, because now like, it's a little teeny thing. Yeah. Slow moving, uh, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the good performance, uh, period. Or, you know, I mean, it would be. Well, <laughs> I mean, how about just. 79% certified fresh or whatever. Yes, yes. You know, or, or, or not, or something that's like that. That's sort of a scary you know. thing. It's you know? terrifying, yeah. you know. Uh, but that's the way it is. Um, and, and you know, you can't, you can't fight that. All you can say, that's the way it is. And you have to keep finding a way to keep making movies yeah. that you would like to make. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know? So that's the, the challenge. In some ways, it's easier to get into the business. Right than it was in the past. I yeah. mean, when I first started out, the idea of uh, getting a chance to make a movie seemed impossible. Yes. Yeah. In fact, I never even thought of the idea of making a, a film. Yeah. And it didn't enter my mind until much, much later. Yeah. It's like Marty Scorsese says, it felt like taking a Citadel. It was just something that, you know, you need, or you needed a, a magic password yeah. to get in. Yeah. It's, it's, it's ironic, you know, because everybody has a different way of, of getting into the business and, you, and you'll hear that some people actually had uh, a certain drive to get into the film business. I, when I grew up, the idea of getting into the film business was unimaginable. Right. Because you never heard of anybody yeah. Yeah. that was in the film business. It was like, I think I'd like to be royalty someday, you know, kind so, of like that. Yeah. You know, I, I grew up in Baltimore, which right. is uh, far away from Australia, but uh, <laughs> the... Uh, but it's near the water, so <laughs> yeah, that's, that's <laughs> right? It. Very close. Yeah. Right. So you know. Uh, so the idea of uh, I didn't even know what a director was. Right. And the first time I actually paid attention to that, I was a kid and I went to see On the Waterfront, mm. and there was a scene in it where uh, Marlon Brando is with Eva Marie Saint, oh, cool. and he's a one-time boxer, and she dropped the glove, and he picked up the glove, and he was sitting there, and he's talking to her, and he's trying to put the glove on his hand. Yeah. And I thought that was maybe the most amazing thing I'd ever seen in a film because mm. it was so simple. And I went outside and I looked at the, the poster and, and I'm looking at names and writer and then director and mm. Ilya Kazan. And I said, I wonder if he has something to do with that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that was the, the first time that I actually started to look at credits right. and try to figure out who does what and how does it happen. Yeah. Because I, I, as, a, as a kid, I just couldn't understand how did that happen? Hmm. That he just put this glove on instead of a boxing glove, he's putting on a little white glove, you know, a woman's glove on hmm. his hand, and it was like a, wow, that's really amazing. Yeah, and there's an amazing Kazan. There's a book of, of interviews with him where he goes on for pages about crafting that scene, how it worked. I think. Yeah, Brad, no, it's know. uh, it, it's. It's one of those little things in life that you remember, you know, because as a kid, I would go to the movies every Saturday, you know, with my cousin. And we went, we didn't even know what was playing. You just went every Saturday to the, to the theater. Mm -hmm. And you'd go see, what, see that. And then that was, happened to be this movie called Old and Waterfront. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't like we heard about it or anything. It mm -hmm. just every week there was a new movie at the theater. Yeah. And that's one of those things that you have to do. At, I think that if I'm if I'm remembering it correctly, Brando just did that on the spot, and then they worked yeah. from it. And yeah. so, as a director, that's one of the key things that you have to do is be alive to. Well, what's happening. here's the thing about the film. Now, if it's not true, it sure sounds like it's true. There's the famous scene in that Charlie, you're my brother. Uh, in the back of the taxi cab. And uh, they're getting ready to do the scene. Now, as I say, maybe it's not true, but it Where sounds. The Brando like wasn't it. there. No, no, no. Oh. They're getting ready to do the scene, mm. and uh, Brando says to Eli Kazan, uh, this scene doesn't make any sense, <laughs> the taxi cab scene. And he said, well, what, what's the problem? He said, well, well what is he going to do? He's going to kill me? I mean, he's my brother. You know, he pulls a gun on me. I, I don't believe it. And Kazan, 
rather than arguing the point, said, well, then play it that way. Now, if you see the film, yeah, that's right. uh, Rod Steiger pulls out the gun, and Brando goes, jolly, jolly, jolly. Yeah, puts, puts, puts his hand on the gun yeah. like, are you kidding me? Yeah. You're not going to kill me. And that's what made the scene so astounding yeah. because he was so dismissive of it that it's impossible. Now, if you think of it the other way, and this is the way Brando was thinking of it, and maybe everyone else is, he pulls the gun and he goes, Charlie, Charlie, you're my brother. You know what I mean? And instead, Charlie, Charlie, just dismissive. Yeah. That's why the scene becomes so famous. Yeah. The other is doing exactly, you know, cause and effect, cause and effect, which the normal response. And now the brilliance of it is two things. One is that Brando has had an instinct about how that should play out. And Kazan had an understanding of, well, then play it that way. And let me see what it is rather than, no, 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 no. You got to do this. Hmm. So there is a time as the director has to say, well, look, he's talented. Then let me see what he's up to. And we can make adjustments rather than, no, this is the way we do it. Yeah. And I think that was where Kazan was able to, because of his theater experience, et cetera, was able to kind of allow certain moments to happen. Yeah. Yeah, we're fresh. He was in pursuit of that, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. that's really what you're doing as a director. Yeah. And it is interesting that when for the reaction shots, Rod Steiger's singles, yeah, uh, Brando wasn't there. Right, he was, he was seeing a psychiatrist, and so Kazan yeah. did the. So yeah, yeah. Uh, Kazan, Kazan was Rod on the Steiger other. Rod Steiger did it all with uh, with Kazan on the other side yeah. of the camera, um, and that's another interesting thing, you know, stuff the way that things are pieced together sometimes. Uh, well, that's the nature of film. Yeah, that's it's right. It's all these pieces. Exactly. And, uh, and and if you you could take a great scene and you put the pieces together in a wrong way and it doesn't work. Yeah, and the, that's And right. it was there. Yeah. It just got lost in the editing room. Yeah. That, uh, that's what makes the business so fascinating because if it's edited incorrectly, it'll screw it up or it can make it better. Yeah. And all of those elements about script and changes that happen or accidents or the actor went off and forgot his lines and said something else, which was better than what the line would have been on the page. Mm -hmm. You know, so there is all of these because you're talking about uh, a large group of people that have to come together from costumes to whatever. And right. they are all in support of this piece. Yes, that's and, right. And inside of it, there are all these variables that happen. Yeah, that's right. And you have to be alive to every single one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do. I'm, I'm wondering if you share my impression that, that there, I see a lot of films where I feel like there's a thought behind the camera somewhere that we're going to put it together in the cutting room. It's, it's, and they don't quite come out right for right. that reason. Yeah. I mean, in the cutting room, you adjust you know, you have to have a very clear idea, idea though, when you're shooting. It's not, you know. Uh, pretty much, though. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to. Uh, sometimes uh, th there's decisions that you will know. You say, well, that, that particular uh, moment isn't as good. Let's do it again. Right. And you say, we don't really need to because it's going to work in the two shot. Right. Uh, so let's not just beat this up. It's yeah. not necessary. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so you, you, you do, in a sense, have to think of editing as to how is this going to go. You say, well, this, this is not exactly right, but we don't need to waste the time because why would I be in that shot at mm -hmm. that moment? Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, they're all, yeah, you, you, your brain has got to be thinking all the time about how does this go together? Yeah. Uh, what do we need to add? Or maybe we better have another shot of this, et cetera. So yeah. that's, all, that's the ongoing process. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, there's always the changes in the script because certain things. Yeah, uh, that's right. They yeah, fall away. or they, yeah. yeah, or somehow the location isn't right. Yeah. And then you have to compensate in some way to make it work. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you um, uh, talk about your transition from shooting on, I mean, do you shoot mostly on digital now or do you shoot on film? Uh, on digital. Yeah. And what about that transition? I mean, that was a big transition in the cutting room and color. Um, and then, of course, you know, in yeah. uh, the way that films are seen. And, yeah. Well, I mean, it's um, look, it's it's faster in a sense of shooting on uh, digital because you're not suddenly shooting and then you're constantly changing. Right. You know, uh, rolls of film all the time. 
And they are developing it that it gets closer and closer to film, mm -hmm. uh, where sometimes you really have to examine yes. one from the other. Um, in terms of editing, uh, it's a huge difference. Yeah. Because uh, I was, uh, if you can imagine, you might have cut a scene together in a certain way when you're using film and you have to cut the film itself. And then you say, gee, I wonder if it's better if we do this, this, and this, and this. And then you make all those changes. And then there's that moment you go, well, you think that's better than the other way? Because mm -hmm. now if you, the other way doesn't exist. Now you got to go back and stick it all back together. Right, again, that's right. Where now you can have four versions of the scene. Yep. And just like that, watch the four versions as opposed to uh, the old way of, I'm not sure if it was better the other way. You know? yeah. <laughs> There's that <laughs> doubt that comes, yeah. to, <laughs> comes to mind. Uh, so yeah. in, in many ways, the, the, it's a quicker process, yeah. or in some cases it could be slower because now you've got so many options right. that you're sort of uh, paralyzed to try to make a decision. So and you sometimes can that can happen to some uh, directors. And if you want to slow something down, you can see it slowed down instead yeah. of indicating that you want to see it slowed yeah, down you know, eventually. Or if you want to dissolve, you don't put a grease paint, yeah. you know, mark through. And wait through. three days to get it back. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, you yeah. see everything instantly. So it's a big change, huh? Yeah. Mm. And but then, of course, you know, then you can have like a seven-year-old kid can edit. Yeah. And Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> didn't say have to do it well. <laughs> but you can edit. You can just see yeah. how much we can play with and how much we understand. Yeah. I mean, you have to think Which is a from great the thing. beginning in a hundred years that uh, the great train robbery, supposedly, when the character pointed the gun at the screen and fired it, that the audience ducked a hundred years ago. That's now 1903. It's like, oh, okay. You know, yeah. Now it's like, okay, I got it. Yeah. Right. And, and there's more visual fluency and more familiarity. Yeah. The, other, the other area is color. I mean, that's ch color correct. Yeah. Um, that's just, you know, DI's No, you can do all kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's much more, there, there are much more options. Yeah. I don't know if it necessarily makes it better. Right. But it is part of the, and the language does change because you don't have to do certain things that you used to have to do. Like sometimes it used to be, okay, we have to establish where we are right. first. And then you can, you know what I mean? Where yes. now you don't have to have that. Yeah. You know, there's certain things like you have to open the door and go into the room. You just couldn't go into the room. Right. Yeah. So now our, we, because of film language, we got it. Okay, we're here. Oh, yeah. we're in the past. Okay. You know, yeah. we, we accept things much faster. Yes. Uh, in visualization as opposed to uh, decades ago where we needed to be informed more. Yeah. On the other hand... You know what Alfred Hitchcock said, never waste an establishing shot on establishing something. <laughs> <laughs> Save it for when it's going to you know, have yeah. an emotional impact. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but in yeah. the beginnings, you had to take those baby right. steps. Right, exactly. And uh, so yeah. we become uh, uh, more facile in terms of how do we, how do we comprehend information yep. right. than in the past. Yeah. But here's the irony that I have yet to anyone been able to explain. If you watch an older film, 30s, 40s, uh, they are much faster. Yeah. They talk much faster than in a modern film. Yeah. In a time when the world is going faster, the movies are going slower. Yes, that's true. Which I, I, I can't figure that one out. Because you, and those, and those movies might be like, uh, uh, well, where are we going? Well, I don't know. We've got to find out. Are you sure? No, I'm going to find out. Okay, check with me later. You know, they will talk like that in those movies, which is in a sense yeah. came from radio. Yeah. Because radio had to talk fast, and then films began to talk fast. Yeah. Now we go, we go slower. Yeah. I mean, that's where Orson Welles comes out of radio, because you yeah. know, he had that kind of sense of rhythm. And, and there is a real yeah. kind of propulsion, you know, to that whole thing, where yeah. nowadays it's much slower. Mm -hmm. Even in a scene like there's people sitting around the table. Mm -hmm. It's slower by yes. nature than when it used to be. Yeah. So that's one of the things I can never quite figure out. Yeah. But that's there is a thing, uh, and I'll tell you this, um, one of the first jobs I had was when I was on American University, I, I got a job because the professor took a liking to me, I got a job at the television station, and one of the first things we used to do was roll the commercial breaks into the late show and the late, late show. So... I used to see two movies a night, yeah. The Late Show and The Late Late Show, uh, 
and for say you know so I'd see like 12 movies a week yeah and now sometimes the the film would break and you go to a please stand by and whatever and you lose a scene and something happened or whatever and uh, they put up the wrong reel and etc and all that stuff seldom did anyone ever call mm -hmm. to say i don't understand what happened right they don't it's there was hardly an, a call about that and i'll give you one example this is the there was a a movie called the man from the alamo with glenn ford mm. and uh <laughs> I, I wasn't uh, working at that night, and some other young uh, person, uh, floor director, was doing it. And normally there's a thing, I'll say, Glenn Ford goes out the door, and then that means you fade to black, right. late show slide commercials. Yeah. So the first reel got out of whack, and it started going 10, 9, or whatever, and then the guy didn't know what to do, and et cetera. And he didn't check to make sure what was wrong. He yeah. just continued on. So. The late show starts at 11.30, uh, would run at least to 1, and at 11.30, at 10 minutes to 12, it went the end. <laughs> <laughs> and so he had put up the, the they got it mixed uh, up, put the last reel up uh, first. Goodness. And they went to the slide, right, late show, and then went to the announcer. The announcer said, and now for the beginning of the man from the <laughs> Not one phone call. Yeah. Like, yeah. why did we just watch the ending before the beginning? <laughs> Not one phone call. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, I, and I was working on the, the sign-off, which is like at quarter to three in the morning, and there was like a jet plane with the, with the national yeah. anthem, you know, yeah. blah, 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 this thing, and the jet plane. Yeah. I got a call from somebody saying, why are you showing the old uh, F so-and-so? Because it's showing uh, there oh is a God. newer version. <laughs> On the plane in the sky, yeah. this, and I said, "Well, oh, they made a mistake. Yes, but it's showing our weakness that we oh, have better goodness. planes than the one you're showing." Oh no! Now that person's <laughs> paying attention to that, but yeah. on the other hand, the ro the reels but they didn't can be care about up, seeing okay. Man from the Alamo. Yeah. As, actually, as an interesting aside, you know, uh, Roger Corman uh, made movies for the drive-in market, as you know, and a lot of them were really short. They would be like. 65 minutes, 67 minutes, right. 70 minutes. Monty Hellman uh, started with Roger Corman and he was editing for him and then he had a job um, with, with Roger uh, filming stuff that would create extra scenes to make the films long enough for commercial TV. <laughs> you know, li like just little little things that he would add on right. that made no sense whatsoever, <laughs> but there were some, you know, kind of part of the movie. Yeah, out. yeah, different days. <laughs> um, do you have... Uh, Younger filmmakers coming to you and asking you for advice about yeah. how to, yeah, yeah. You know, about yeah. about uh, various things, yeah. Yeah, and if you were, you know, s just starting out in the business today, um, I mean, for someone who's doing that, where would you direct them? Or in, I mean, well, in the business a, of trying to get it, films made. It's a tough thing because, in other words, uh, the, the one with the biggest advantage is the writer. Mm -hmm. Because y you can always write. Yeah and then show it to people. Yeah. It's hard if you've never directed to show what you've directed. Yeah. You know, it's much harder to, to do that. So the, the writer has a little bit of a head start. Yeah, right. Uh, and so uh, you can offer advice. It's very difficult because I don't exactly know. I mean, every, people get into this business in all different kinds of ways. Right. You know, as you know. So uh, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's somehow having the the tools that are necessary. I mean, I started, although I studied uh, basically. Uh, you started as a writer. Um, well, in, I started, now originally I went to an acting class. Okay, who's in which school was that, by the this way? This was called the Oxford Theater, uh, not in England. It was on Oxford Street in mm -hmm. LA, yeah. little place. And I, I went there, and then I was there every day for like two years. Yeah. And I didn't want to act. Um, what, uh, wait a minute, what? I, <laughs> I, I had no interest in acting. Uh, you were just studying acting. I was just, I, can I just, I, I'll just give you a short version of this. Yeah. If just as, like how nutty the business is and the happenstance of it all. I was living at the beach. I'd come out from Baltimore. I was living out in uh, Santa Monica, Hermosa Beach area. And I was hanging around. I was broke. I had no money. I got friendly with a guy named George. And 
and one of his friends, and we would hang out together. And one day, he said, uh, we were sort of rooming together at one point, and he said, look, can you give me a ride up to Hollywood because my car broke down? So I gave him a ride up, and uh, we parked, and he said, come on in. I said, what are you doing? He said, I want to check out this acting class. I said, oh, I'll wait in the car I don't know, <laughs> with this acting. I don't know, I'll wait here. He said, no, come on in, you know. So anyway, he drags me in, and we go there, and I'm, and it, w it was sort of interesting. It was much better than in college. It was more lively, yeah. and the teacher was sort of interesting. And so uh, he signs up, and he said, why don't you sign up? Because mm -hmm. it's an hour ride back and forth. I said, but what are we going to do? I don't want to act. He said, doesn't, doesn't matter. It'll be, you know, some good-looking girls. It'll be fun. Mm. It's something to do, you know, a couple times a week. And so I said, mm. I go back the next day, and, you know, after George is pestering me about it and I said to the acting teacher I said I'd like to join the class uh, but I don't want to act and he said well what do you want to do I said just watch I'll just watch and he said well you can't just watch you have to participate or you can't be in this <laughs> and I said okay so I joined and then I start going and George and I go back and forth you know and within two months George is bored he doesn't want to go anymore <laughs> and I'm getting interested in it right not to act, but I'm fascinated by the process. Right. And so uh, one day I said to George, I said, George, if you're not going to go, it's an hour ride back and forth. I'm going to move up into Hollywood. I'll get closer, you know, to the school. <clears throat> so I moved out. I tried to explain to people who were younger that when you moved in those days, it's pre-cell phone, you lose contact with the person. Yeah. You just don't know where they are. Yeah. And... <clears throat> so I said, look, from that acting class, in a sense, this guy George was responsible because I went to the acting class, and the acting class led to improvs, and improvs led to sketch writing, and then I got a local show and another show, and I was writing, and then that led to one thing and another, and eventually, you know, writing and directing. And then it led to your performance in High Anxiety. You know, and yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I did that, uh, went through all that, and I said, and, but it's basically because of George. And so what happened to George? I said, I don't know. I never saw him again because, you know, I yeah. moved out, never yeah. ran into him. So in the year 2000, I'm with my wife. We go to the movies, go see this film, Blow. Right. Right? Uh, Johnny Depp. And it starts off, it says, you know, uh, Santa Monica Beach, whatever, 1967. And I said, no, I said, when I went out to L.A. in 1967. Mm -hmm. And then I said, hey, George. I hear George on the screen. George. Okay. And then I hear, like, you know, George Young or whatever. I said, I go, George Young. And I said to my wife, I said, that's the name of the guy that I went to the acting school. <laughs> and so if you saw the movie, the character George Young uh, became the largest cocaine dealer in North America. There you go. <laughs> and that was the George that said, hey, can you give me a ride and go to the acting school? Yeah. And that's how I basically did that. Yeah. So... <laughs> <laughs> because of that, can you give me a ride is how I did one thing that led to another, then ultimately where I am. Wasn't How uh, crazy is that? I mean, <laughs> you can't write that. So that doesn't make any sense. So wasn't, on the other, f the flip side, wasn't Alex Rocco, the actor, started as a member of Whitey Bulger's Winter Hill Gang in Boston, did left, he? went out to L.A., became a member of the Baha'i Faith, and I guess one day, you know, Whitey Bulger, and he's like, hey, you know, let's go to the movies. And they go to see The Godfather, and there's Alex Rocco as Mo Green. Oh, that's what happened to that guy, you know. No, um, that's it. Yeah. Look, I mean, yeah. how you get into the business it, it, in different ways. That acting class was really interesting because you are, when you're doing improvisations, and the key thing for me was if you're in an improvisation, well, who are you? Right. And, and then once you know who you, you are, right. then you can say all kinds of things. Right. And so then I went, oh, well, what if I write and I think the same way? Then I mm -hmm. can say things. So when I write, I keep thinking the character in my head, and then, I'm, I, then everything just sort of goes, and I try to keep up. Literally, I feel like I'm doing dictation. Right. And then I'm trying to keep up with those actors. But it, that was the connection was the act, in the yeah. acting class. Yeah. And, uh, and that you're open enough that the behavior will evolve. And in a sense, that's where Diner comes mm -hmm. is, in a sense that, yes, it does really have a story that runs through it. But the behavior of the characters and how they interact with one another gets down to this sort of 
what appears to be nonsense, but w most of the time we never talk to people straight ahead. We never say exactly what's on our mind. Yeah. We're always going left and right of it. And so they, what you might call inarticulate language is what we do quite often. And that's what, in a sense, Diner was, is to write where you're off center and you're not really dealing with the issues. Right. And uh, That's good writing. Yeah. And that's so. good filmmaking. That's why I would say that, if, as an example, if you were looking at, uh, in terms of how does exposition work in terms of a film, and I always think of uh, uh, the uh, Casablanca as yeah. a great piece of expositional writing. At the very beginning, you see Bogart, he's got a club in Casablanca, uh, he doesn't help a guy who gets killed, etc. And that's maybe 15 minutes of the movie. Now, we don't really know much about this Bogart character, and there's a little scene when uh, Claude Rains, who's the inspector for the police department, or what, sits with him. And he said, you know, I always wondered, uh, Rick, uh, what brought you to Casablanca? <laughs> and he said, uh, you know, uh, I, I came for the water. For my health. Yeah, my yeah, health, yeah. right? You know, and he says, and about the water. And he said, but, you know, but Casablanca is a, is a desert. And he said, well, I was misinformed. <laughs> right? Now... That is telling the audience that he hasn't been there for 10 years. It's, it's more recent. Uh, some, for some reason, he came there. We're not, we're not, we don't know, but it set the table. Yep. And, and yet, it's, otherwise, you can say, well, there was a problem in Paris, uh, the old girl, and they all laid it out. Mm -hmm. But that becomes boring as opposed to laying certain pieces that we're going to yeah. find out about. But That's we right. don't need to know it right away. Yep. And it's a great piece of uh, blocking yeah. something yeah you're, you're opening a, a mystery you're yeah. starting with a question yeah. maybe we can take some questions from the audience we have a little bit of time so if anyone ha wants to jump in yes and that's really a question about editing um and and yeah. how much s structuring and restructuring you do um you know you'll <coughs> move certain things around but you have a pretty i mean i have a pretty good idea what i think it's supposed to be um I know some films, you might say, are made in the editing room, but I have a pretty good idea. Now, sometimes you say, you know, I don't think we need that scene here. It's too early to give that information, and maybe I'll delay it at two scenes or whatever, or maybe we don't need it. Maybe it's just not necessary. Uh, but uh, I've sort of always had like a pretty good picture of how this is supposed to play out and what its rhythms are. And, and that, that applies to shooting of a scene that sometimes you're doing a scene you go it's not bad but it feels too lethargic for at this point in time so you have to think of rhythm information uh and uh, the levels of the performance and the subtleties of it all and in the editing room you can certainly finesse things if need be but I, I i've heard of certain films really made in the editing room but i haven't had that experience yeah i mean you have to have the architecture in place, I think so. really. You can't, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, wait for the mic. Here it comes. Uh, what film are you most proud that you've made? You know, it's a good question. I, I don't really um, uh, watch them after I've done them. <laughs> like sometimes I'll be flipping channels, I'll start to watch and I go, oh, I did that film. Um, <laughs> and, and then change the channel immediately as opposed to watch it again. Uh, so I don't, I, I can't say that I have a, a favorite. You know, I would say that Diner was the first movie that I, that I wrote and directed. So obviously it's the first. But I, I never try to evaluate it or think about them or uh, kind of re-review them in any way. I just figure it's done. I did it. Hey, can I ask you about the experience of working on the script of Blazing Saddles? You I worked on the Blazing script Saddles. of Blazing Saddles, but no, you, oh, you worked on another. I'm sorry. Uh, high anxiety. High anxiety. Silent movie with Mel Brooks. And silent movie. What was it like working with Mel Brooks? He is. Uh, first of all, he. In general, he's like maybe the funniest person right. that I've met yeah. because he is uh, uh, so crazy. In, in this way, it's like 
He'll say, like, I don't want to just a little laugh. I don't want a little. I want a laugh that is so that you're watching it and you can't breathe and you fall out of your chair. You're choking to death because it's that funny. <laughs> I mean, so yeah. that's what he wants, you know. Uh, and, uh, and so he was great to work with because he's very open, you know. So we were yeah. together all the time, all during, you know, writing of the stuff yeah. and, uh, and uh it, it was it was a great learning experience because we were on the set because he was in the film high anxiety as an example he was in it so we would sit you know in the monitors and watch and um that was in a sense the beginning of like i'd see something and i thought gee i wonder if you if you did that instead of that and most of it i kept it to myself because i'm thinking about how you might do certain things right and uh and he was very open you know because um you know, sometimes he says, "All right, we're ready to move on." You know, and then I and this is the way he would he could he could he would work. Uh, I'd say, uh, Mel, maybe if you did this, so and so, and all this, and this is the way he would handle it. Hold on, we're not moving on yet because Barry's not happy. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, and and so then we would like do it. But he was, he could say things that I don't know anybody can get away with. Years ago at, at Fox, when uh, Marvin Davis bought the, the, the company, that, yeah. he was a huge man, huge, gigantic <laughs> man. And we were all in this, uh, in the dining room, and he, he came in, you know, Marvin Davis came in, and the place got quiet, and then he sat down, and then he had his lunch or whatever, and then when he got up to leave, it got quiet, and when... Marvin Davis went out the door, and soon as, as soon as the door closed, Mel yelled out, did you ever see such a fat man in your entire life? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know anybody that can, yeah. he could be that <laughs> bold yeah. about things, because that's the way he was. But he was great, and yeah. he was, um, it, we, were, we were there during, uh, obviously, the writing, and then the casting, and then mm. uh, the the pre-production, and then in the editing phase of it. And so I got a wow. chance to see yeah. every aspect of it. On both movies? On both films, yeah. Silent Movie and High Anxiety, for yeah. both of those films. Yeah. And so that was a great learning experience. Yeah. A friend of mine worked as a publicist on the re-release of Young Frankenstein, and she was like, we need a tagline. You know, maybe the best comedy, the best horror comedy, black and you know. And he said, how about the best movie ever made? <laughs> 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 that yeah. sounds good to me. Yeah. No. Yeah, maybe one or two more. Yeah, right. Up. Oh, okay. Well, yep. No problem. Um, when you're casting and working with actors, what are the traits of the actors that you like to work with the best? How do you? Who inspires you? You know. <coughs> who inspires me? Or are you talking about just when in you're casting? on set and when you're working? What are the best type of actors for you to work with and the traits? Best kinds there? of actors. Yeah. I I I like uh, those that will. Um, that don't necessarily have a totally pre preconceived idea about everything. You know what I mean? In other words, like I've worked with Pacino a number of times and, and, uh, and De Niro. Uh, and what I like about them is that you can say, well, I wonder if you, if we, whatever that may be. And they're like, oh, let me, let me try, let me see, whatever. And so they're willing to play around in it. And, uh, and we'll sort of do something a little bit different. Not radically different, but little you know moments of that, and I and um, that's very exciting. That it, they're not so bound by no, this is what I do. That they they can they can continue to uh, tweak things one way or another, and uh, that that's a great thing to have because you're 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 you're, you're dialing it a little bit this way or a little bit mm. that way. You know, it, 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 it's always coming with credibility. It's not like well. We don't have a performance here. How are we going to get a performance? That happens on occasion, but you've got it, but maybe there's an extra thing here that we can explore. You find other values as you're working with the actor. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to ask you about working with another actor in, a, um, in, in Tin Men, Richard Dreyfuss. That's a beautiful performance and yeah. great character. He was terrific in that. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was fun to work with, and uh, uh, I remember one time... Um, he was doing this scene, and uh, he suddenly he's looking, and he's going, he's, he's like this, you know, and whatever it may be. And I just, I didn't say cut or whatever, just let it go. And then he, he went into the line, and 
yeah. et cetera. And he said afterwards, he said, you know, I'm sorry, I, I completely forgot the line and whatever. I said, I love that. <laughs> the, it yeah. looked like you were trying to figure out what to say as the character, not as the line. Right. And I thought it was such a natural thing because we're not always that. I got it. It's yeah, like, yeah. Right. And, and you can see that he was thinking, and it made it an interesting moment. Yeah. And yeah. so, uh, um, you know, there's those little surprises that happen along the way, but I thought he was really terrific in that yeah. film. Yeah. He and Danny DeVito were an interesting odd couple, if you can call it that. Yep. So this lady here. Hello. Um, so my question is, whereabouts do you draw inspiration for your characters and your plots when you are formulating a new project? Do you try drawing from your own life and experiences or do you kind of borrow from different films? Like, what's your main source? Of uh, not from other films. I'm very bad about taking things from films. Like, you know, there are some people who say, you know, this and then I, I never can quite apply what was done in some movie to what I'm doing. Uh, but I, sometimes I think of characters I, I know and I'll use them or I'll just see characters on the street and see how they behave and think, well, that person was interesting, uh, you know, and then I'll think about that character and how I can uh, weave it into something that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I very seldom are able to, mainly because... When I see characters in a movie, I go, well, that character's fascinating. So I don't want to take that character because th that character was great in that. So I, I'll, I'm always sort of drawing on things that I remember in terms of people that I know or people that I've seen and how they behave. But from a nuts and bolts perspective, do you have like, oh, yeah, I remember that shot in so-and-so. I want, you know, have it that kind of vocabulary in your, in your head from the movies that you've seen? Uh, Which is a different kind of question. I that. mean, I may remember that, right. but I never know how to apply it. I see, okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, a, it's, like, it's like, for me personally, when people say, do a remake yeah. of something. I, right. I don't know, if I like the movie, I would never want to remake yes. it. Yes, right. You know, sure. I, I don't understand yeah. that concept. I love that movie. I want to do a remake. Yeah, yeah I, it's I, a very, very strange idea. I, my, my brain can't work that way. <laughs> yeah, um, right. So, um, uh, and and whatever that person did, however, is that's fine. Yeah. And then I just have to figure out what it is that I'm doing. Yeah. That that works for me, because I don't know how to work with genres in a real sense. I don't understand. Um, uh, I, I just have to invent whatever it is, and I don't know how to uh, reference it to something else. Right, right. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about, as we close, what you're working on now? Or? Uh, I'm working on a film called Harry Haft, which is, um, it takes place, um, um, well, I mean, it, it, it's, it's different parts to it. Uh, there was a character, uh, Harry Haft was a real character, who was in a, in a concentration camp in World War II and actually fought other prisoners in World War II. Uh, and when he came to America, he continued to fight now professionally and actually fought Rocky Marciano before Marciano became champion. Uh, but the piece, in a sense, is what it really is. And, 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 and now th this goes back to my experience again. In, because most of the, mo the movie doesn't really take place in, the, in uh, the camps. It's part of the flashbacks. He's really, in a sense, dealing with what you might call today as post-traumatic stress disorder, is that he cannot get rid of the past. It, it haunts him. And, and the, the reason I made that connection is that when I was a kid, um, I just touched upon it in a, in a scene that I did called Avalon where the, my grandmother's brother came to America. And I didn't even know she had a brother. I, don't, I didn't know anything about him or anything, and they never talked about it. And they put him up in my bedroom in a cot on the other side of the room. And I was a little kid, and he would wake up at night, and he'd be thrashing about, and he'd be talking in some language I never heard of. And it was obviously bothered. And I remember waking up and seeing this a number of nights. And then I didn't find out for another 15 years that he was in a concentration camp. And so I, was, I always stayed in my head. And when I read, because uh, it's from a book, 
when I read about this story, I thought, oh, well, that reminds me of, because he was totally haunted by the past. And when he had kids, he never talked to the kids about what happened. And he kept that to himself. And then in a sense that that offered a, or created a sort of a, a separation that the you know kids will suspect and begin to think something's wrong, but if you never talk about it, they assume that it's 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 me you know it's it's me my father doesn't like me or he won't get close to me or whatever and I and so that stayed with me and then this piece came up and I thought well this might be an interesting way to to begin to address something that I've not seen uh, it's not simply the camps and that it is really being haunted. And at a time that never, because it, the, the film goes in 49 and 63, he's haunted by all those things and it, the effects that it has on family and uh, relationships. Thanks a lot, Barry. This was great. And thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys.